Before we jump in, a warning that we are an explicit book podcast. Yes, that means swearing, shitty jokes, and a whole lot of dark humour that some may take offence to. Please check your trigger warnings on all of the books we cover. You've been warned. The episode starts in three, two, one. <laughs> A book in a bed. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of A Book and a Bev. Today is the closest you will ever get to your hosts, aka Bryony, Ellie, and Georgia, speaking about science in a somewhat way that isn't likely to severely insult an entire community, we hope. That's right, we are covering the feel good rom com Star Wars fanfic, which is The Love Hypothesis by Ali Hazelwood. For those that are video, I'm holding the book. To start off, everyone, what are we drinking today? I have got a pink gin that matches the fluff that was this book. Oh, I love that. The fluff. I decided to get a little bit frisky today, and <laughs> I'm calling this one the scientific experiment. It doesn't look crazy, though. as no. a slight pink tinge. It looks like it's but got it's- FDA approval. Yeah. It looks like slightly it's- old dishwater. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that could be it. It's basically <laughs> all the alcohol I had in my fridge, as well as I had lemon, lime, and bitters, like cordial, and I put a little bit of that in it. And it's got lychee, seltzer, a little bit of watermelon seltzer, and then like a little bit of lemonade as well, because I didn't want to just like die yeah <laughs> wowzers okay could have turned out worse honestly with the amount of bourbon i usually have in my household yeah i was gonna say that could have been like a deep brown mm. i am drinking uh a brookvale union ginger beer this is one of my favorite drinks and it has absolutely nothing to do with the book that one's really good. It's just like it is the easiest stuff to drink. It's so good. I was going to maybe try and do like a Starbucks coffee theme, you know, from all of her sweet tooths, but I changed my mind and it's not relevant. So that's fun. Okay. General vibes for the book, everyone. How did we feel? I've got a different opinion to you both. <gasps> not to be a downer, but we all kind of expect this from me at this point in time. <laughs> I didn't love it. In fact, I didn't really like it at all. Up until... We boned. The first two thirds of the book, not okay with it. But once we saw the dick, I'm all right. I'm I did- literally tearing up. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'm sorry, but I just, I found the first three quarters of this book to just be too slow. Like, I like a little bit of a slow burn when the plot is enough to keep me on the line, but I found myself really bored. I knew smart was going to come, literally come, the more and more I read. But then I started realizing, like, we've gotten through a decent chunk of this book and there's been no smart. What is going on? There's just going to be like a one and done scene here and that's what it was so yeah, you know it's a fluffy romance it's not a smart book Ellie oh, I, know, <laughs> I know but there just there wasn't enough romance they had like 15 minute weekly coffee dates that's not enough for me to have an emotional connection with these characters and I also found the FMC too annoying I get that she's goofy and an academic with like little life experience but the girl was 26 years old and acting like a fucking 14 year old tween applying sunscreen to her boyfriend of two days. It was just infuriating. Also, we get no description of her at all. What colour hair does she have? Brunette. Well, we get that from the cover of the book, but there's nothing (laughs) in the book. Also, I think I know more about Adam Carlson, which is that he's tall and that's about it. Speaking of, he has zero personality up until the point of coitus, which is he comes out to play a little bit more during that. But literally the whole book prior to that is just him channeling his inner Edward Cullen and that's it. We can tell that you, I don't think you knew that this was a fanfic of the Star Wars, <laughs> Star I did Wars not. before this, but it's fine. Right. Okay. <laughs> did not know that. Don't care. <laughs> it shitted me. <laughs> Okay. Also, the miscommunication trope is my least favorite, and this book was filled with it. The adults in a graduate program, you would think that they'd be able to have a fucking conversation. Like, when we do get to the Tom confrontation part, I I got on board, but it took way too long to get there. I don't know about the whole Star Wars fanfic. It wasn't clear to me. Clearly, I haven't seen that. It was a struggle for me to get through. I'm so, so scared because you're doing part one. I am so scared. It's brutal. Well, this book to me was... (laughs) Beautifully brilliant. (laughs) It has a majority of my favorite tropes. It has grumpy sunshine. So you have the sunshine, little bubbly, little and then you have the grumpy little, mm, you know, he falls first. We have the he falls first. 
and the fake dating. <gasps> yum, yum, yum. But honestly, I think Ali Hazelwood has such an incredible way of writing grumpy love interests that makes me like clench inwardly and outwardly. And they have like wonderful, filthy mouths and with looks that could kill in every direction but at the FMC. And I fucking love that. I just love Adam Carlson. I just love him. I just love him. He holds a special place in my heart. I just absolutely loved this book. It was also that like absolute perfection of I will kill you if you hurt my love vibe, which mm. makes me absolutely totally fucking feral. I just love this book. It's such a feel good like rom com. And, you know, I just feel like sometimes it's such a nice little palate cleanser to have these little blips of rom-com in between like these big giant ass fantasy reads that we're doing even if some of us don't fucking like them (laughs) i think i've come to the conclusion (laughs) (laughs) i don't (laughs) i don't mind grumpy i'm okay with grumpy it's the sunshine don't like the sunshine (laughs) that makes sense no yeah that's it you don't like the sunshine yeah yeah and i do think she is a little bit like you know naive and stuff but i think that's because it's supposed to be in a way in which she's been so busy focusing on her study that she's supposed yeah. to be that stereotypical like geeky yeah she was like emancipated from the age of 16 so it was kind of on her oh, own yeah. lost her mother and then you also kind of think, thought she was asexual for a while but you'd kind of think that that experience of being emancipated from the age of 16 and having no close family <laughs> that would wisen you up to the world you'd experience a hell of a lot more shit than the typical 16 year old true would. I, I guess know. it depends on what the way you cope with the trauma, I suppose. Yeah. yeah true. I guess she's emotionally stunted from continuing just to be a high school student. <laughs> she's gone from high school to college to grad. Yeah. What is the yeah. life? Why grow up when you can just always study? Hashtag the mature age student. Ah. My nightmare. So my thoughts. Okay, so for this experiment, you take grumpy sunshine tropes, you add in some fake dating tropes, and you top up your beakers with he falls first and almost who did this to you slash I will avenge your honor moment and congratulations your thesis has been peer-reviewed as a certified banger except the fact that ellie doesn't like it so my joke doesn't work that was too much science in there for me (laughs) (laughs) this book for me is just chef's kiss worthy ali hazelwood went out there and put fucking star wars fan fiction into a fluffy rom-com and i'm never going to be the same the way that like i squeal throughout this book the way i want to go and just watch the most recent star wars movie on mute just to imagine that it's adam carlson and olive smith like mm, it's too much for me someone needs to explain to me the star wars reference because it's it's just not be a ray and kylo ray adam carlson is meant to be Kylo Ren played by Adam Driver and so that is why they literally look like the same people and she is meant to be Rey, aka Daisy Ridley. Look, I'm not the biggest Adam Driver fan so this is all making a lot of sense. He's not for everyone but he is for me. I just remember him from Girls. Yeah, look, he's not a good character in that. No. Anyways, I love, love, love everything about this book and this author and every book she puts out I adore. So, bleh, at Ellie. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, I have the first third of this book, everyone, so strap the fuck in. Terrified. Yeah, I'm going to give you a synopsis of the characters here. So, oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. Don't <laughs> fuck destroy me. me like this. We start with Olive. We have no idea what she looks like <laughs> other than having freckles, and she must be a midget for how often she is on her tippy toes when she talks to Adam. Like every voice <laughs> contestant, she has a tragic backstory, so we know she will go far with her endeavors. <laughs> She is a nerdy nerd who thought she was asexual until she saw Adam's giant schlong. There we have Olive. We have Adam. He is tall. He is mean. He has dimples. For some reason, he is head over heels in love with Olive. He is a professor. So immediately, he is attractive in all of our books. (laughs) We never quite find out why he's attracted to Olive. There's no No, connection. He had a crush on her. They had a conversation. They had a conversation in the bathroom. And she she gave him some inspiring talking. And he just was like, yes, you're so fucking cute. I love you. No. Okay, anyway, side characters. Here we go. We've got Tom. He's a cunt. We've got Arne, who's weirdly pushy. We've got Malcolm, who's the slutty roommate. And we've got Holden, who is our favourite professor. He gives great advice. He's not a car. (laughs) So we shall begin. We start in the prologue. Olive Smith is at grad school interviews having a malfunction with her contact lenses when she runs into a mysterious stranger in the bathroom who begins discussing her life choices. She doesn't know if grad school life is for her. He asks her what her reasons are and she says she has some important research that she just simply must do for important reasons. And the stranger affirms her decision and life moves on. Tell me that that's the basis of a crush because that was or a three-minute interaction. But and he was I like, have crushes on people that I 
see on the other side of the, like, I'm watching football. I see someone, a beautiful woman on the other side of the oval, and I'm like, I love you. I see one person in a 30-second TikTok, and I've got a crush on them, so. Yeah. <laughs> I can have lust, but not a crush. If I'm going to have a crush, I'm going to need to know you a little bit more. Well, maybe it there started are certain... as lust, and then they work together for, like, several years, and so then it's I'm really sorry. It starts crush. as lust as she's standing there putting expired contact lenses in while she's, like, crying. She must can't be an see him. absolute smoke he's shot. Attracted, yeah. He's attracted to her brain. He hasn't known her brain yet. They've <laughs> spoken for three minutes. She's having a conversation with him about how she has important research and she's passionate about that research and she wants to do it herself. I feel like that's so – and he's like, wow, I'm really – like, that's so good. Yeah. He probably just – is one of those things where he probably just always thinks of like, wow, I hope that girl was doing good. We time travel nearly three years later and it turns out Olive listened to The Bathroom Stranger because she is now a grad student. She has found herself in quite the predicament here, though, because she once dated this ranger who her friend Arne – kind of stole from her but it was because they kind of just vibed more but the friend felt bad and she didn't want to steal the ranger so olive lied and told her that she was over the ranger because she was dating someone else but she wasn't really dating someone else and i didn't want to date the ranger and break girl code so olive had to come up with this plan to get out of the house with a date but she obviously wasn't on a date and then Aunt spotted her so now logically she can only kiss the one man that happens to be in the hallway with her to ensure that Aunt still dates the ranger beautiful work that's that, actually friend, a great summary thank you <laughs> yeah. and that's how we maybe some <laughs> <laughs> So it turns out that this man is, in fact, Dr. Adam Carlson, and he is tall and moody and remembers her name. But our mm. FMC is just too off with the fairies to realise this at this point in time and just runs the fuck away after playing some non-consensual tonsil hockey. So good for her. Yes. The next day, Olive receives an email from a Harvard professor, Tom Benton, who wants to have a chinwag about her research on pancreatic cancer. Turns out our girl is actually quite smart. Well done, Olive. But she's, <laughs> well done, Olive, like the tree, as she describes. But she still finds herself in a bit of a pickle here because, you see, she simply must turn this whole kiss the angry professor moment into something more because if she doesn't, she will either lose her best friend for lying or no one dates the ranger, and that's just sad. The ranger so, must be dated. The ranger yeah. must be. Poor Jeremy. I didn't even give him a mention in the side characters. Nah, Jeremy. he's a ranger now. Yeah, he's a ranger. <laughs> that's all you need to know. American listeners, that means red hair. Okay. So, you know, there is an alternative here to all of the above, which is, you know, she could just have an honest conversation with her very reasonable friend but where's the fun in that Absolutely so not. No, it turns out she needn't worry because as she's having a conversation with Arne mid-spiral about the downward trajectory of her life, Dr. Carlson appears and immediately goes with the whole let's save the Ranger's relationship mission. Turns out he also needs to convince his bosses that he's not about to leave his job, so he needs to look like he's putting down roots. So he will pretend to root her instead and then we all win. Oh, ding! (laughs) We all win! We all win! (laughs) So they set some ground rules like no sex which is devastating. They also have a standing weekly coffee date and they will only date for four weeks. Fun. So she tells her roommate Malcolm about the fake dating and he is rightly sceptical about the whole thing because Adam is a bit of a dick and the whole situation seems pretty unnecessary, which, yes, Malcolm agreed, but here we are. So they go to their first weekly coffee date to start to bond, really. He buys her a drink. They talk about where they were born. That's it. Cool. The second one rolls around, and wouldn't you know it, the Harvard professor Tom turns out his besties with Adam, and he crashes their date. So now they must pretend even more. Fantastic. I love it. Tom <laughs> ends up asking a heap of in- invasive questions about Olive's research and history, and we learn her mum died from pancreatic cancer when she was younger. I will not make a joke about that. Okay, moving on. Adam is pretty supportive throughout this whole conversation, and it's good to know that he's not a heartless worm. So, snaps to Adam for the bare minimum. Thank he gets you. snaps from me. He gets many. Many, many snaps. <laughs> oh, she's just right. Okay. Right. Tom has a seminar on some sciencing the next day and Olive and Ann go along. Apparently Stanford isn't really up with the latest OH&S standards because they're all crammed into this room. But the only way that Ann can comfortably view the speech is if Olive sits on Adam's lap. We get three pages of writing on this encounter. There was no boner. It was just sitting. I am disappointed. But it's so cute. It's subtle. And he's just, and he like has his arm around her waist and it's just like the little like squeeze to make sure that she knows that he's there. And ah! I love no, it. no. <laughs> I, I needed, I needed some friction. I needed something. Ellie just only wants like dry humping, dry Pretty humping. Pretty much. I was going to say in the church, dry humping in, in the, the church. church. <laughs> 
if you are in church, you must dry hump. Otherwise, why go to church? Really? <laughs> what are you there for? If not to dry hump? Yeah. Mm. I'm realizing now that I can't deal with romance unless there's also violence. Look, so <laughs> we're realizing this. <laughs> we're realizing things on this podcast. It's fine. So Tom <sighs> tells Olive to get a report to him on her research in like seven days and she smiles and says, sure, no worries, while slowly dying inside. And that is an accurate representation of my work life. Oh. Great. They go to leave the conference and some Muppet left their lights on in their car and her battery died. So Adam again channels Edward <laughs> and uses his vampire big dick strength to move her car by himself with his hands. There he being, actually he uses his dick. He, he uses, uses his dick. dick. Yeah. He yeah. actually yeah. uses the force. Yeah. <laughs> True. Of his dick. <laughs> of his dick. <laughs> Oh, God. But, you know, there's probably, what, 20, 30 people standing in this car park. And Adam's and like, just like, stand back, guys. I've got this. I mean, Slowly we've seen the picture car. of him on a horse. If that if that's pushing a car, you act like any of us are getting in there to help. Uh-uh. <laughs> if it were me, I'd be like, look, I'll come offer assistance and you do the hair flick. And then you just lightly push up against the car, like popping your boobs out a little bit. So there are ways like, around so this. Don't trust Ellie to help you if you've got a flat car. <laughs> yeah. Don't do it. Don't do she it. Will not do it. Push your tits out. She will. Like, Ellie, not now. <laughs> Doesn't matter who you are. If I see you pushing the car along my car, <laughs> I'm not picky anyway. Old grandma. Ellie's <laughs> like, need some help? Push, push. <laughs> Let me get there. Girls up. <laughs> oh, God. No. So, yeah, Aunt tells Olive that she must kiss her boyfriend for this amazing display of masculinity (laughs) and Olive reluctantly obliges and again we get five pages of text leading up to the most anticlimactic kiss of all time oh I'm so (laughs) sad (laughs) it's okay we all have different tastes I just don't like love unless there's a little bit of choking (laughs) Some force yeah. choking again, Star Wars. Okay, so we are kicking off part two of the love hypothesis with one of Olive's colleagues, Greg. Fuck you, Greg. Takes his frustration at Adam out on Olive because remember, Adam's a bit of a dick and he said no to Greg, and Greg was like, meh. It's actually really fucking toxic and Greg can burn in hell next to his failed science project. But anyways, Olive decides now is the perfect moment to text Adam for the first time about this exact issue. Bad Olive. Adam is like, nah, it's not my job to manage fuckwit's emotions. And Olive's response is to say, fuck you. Again, maturity, great decisions, Olive. Adam doesn't respond to her text saying fuck you, but now we don't have time for that because it's time for the staff picnic, right? And Adam is shirtless. Everyone brace yourselves. The quote we get is, Olive, are you listening to this? Nope. No, she was not. She was mostly trying to empty her brain and her eyes too of her fake boyfriend and the sudden warm ache in her stomach. She just wished she were elsewhere, that she were temporarily blind and deaf. Beautiful. Aunt, bless her soul, decides that Olive needs to make sure that Adam is slip slop slapped to perfection. And so she's My rubbing God, the sunscreen in. That is like in. the third reference we've had to slip slop slapping <laughs> in. But this in is the episode. right one. It it's is. actual sunblock this time. <laughs> so Olive is rubbing the sunscreen in and we get this moment. She moved to his shoulder blades. He had a lot of small moles and freckles and she wondered exactly how inappropriate it would be if she played connect the dots on them with her fingers. She could just imagine the amazing pictures it would reveal, which also I do this. <laughs> I'm like, la, 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 la. I know, there's a unicorn on your back. (laughs) To your boyfriend of five years, not to your (laughs) fake boyfriend of two weeks. Nah, fuck it up. No one can be shirtless near me. That's a warning to both of you. Okay. (laughs) Don't come come near her, like, chest first, because she'll just start doing it with your nipples. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Bryony, make sure your car battery does not die around me. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, fuck. Okay. It appears that Adam has forgiven her for saying, fuck you, and he's smiling at her, and I want to die. And then Tom appears and brings up the timeline for Olive to get the report to him. So that's some nice stress. Awesome. But tragedy strikes. Someone ate all of the salt and vinegar chips from the vending machine and it was in fact Adam. So Olive and Adam are eating snacks in the lobby while working late at the lab one night and there's more banter that just makes me want to die where they talk about Adam's Title IX complaint against her for sexual harassment. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Remember that time you tried to rape me? But anyways, Olive is getting distracted. She actually managed to make him laugh and it didn't just transform his face. It 
change the entire space they were inhabiting. Olive had to convince her lungs not to stop working, to keep taking in oxygen, and her eyes not to get lost in the little lines at the corners of his eyes, the dimples in the center of his cheeks. I love it. It's cute and I must die. So they end up discussing how her mum died when she was a teenager from cancer and so Olive was in like the foster care system until she was emancipated at 16 and like Adam supports her while she just has like a little bit of a cry which we love. Adam and Olive are actually like becoming friends and she's comfortable with him and Adam gives her a tip on like this lab problem because maybe she just brings out the best in him. Smash. Smash. He (laughs) says that fake dating her is better than real dating anyone else. But we don't get the reason why that is because the fucking Ranger appears and interrupts the moment. Bad Ranger. Olive sends her report to Tom and he asks her to come over and discuss it at Adam's place. And it goes well and Tom says that she has got a place at Harvard, which is awesome. And like she's fist bumping outside and Adam is just watching our little goofy genius with the cutest look on his face. She ends up running and jumping into his arms and he holds her and whispers like sweet congratulations into her hair. And I love it. Also, in this moment, it needs to be noted, Adam drives a Prius. I don't have words. Can I forgive him? Maybe he has redeemed Priuses everywhere. We are unsure. No. His name (laughs) shall now be Blandem because he is bland. It shall not be that, Ellie. (laughs) Jack that. It does not pass the peer review. It's on the drive back to campus and, like, Olive's apartment when Olive realises that Adam was the guy in the bathroom. She's like, oh, my God, I'm putting together the puzzle pieces. It's fine. They agree to get, like, a celebratory coffee, but first we have Blue Cella, a.k.a. In a surprisingly anti-vax message, the flu shot takes me out because they hold hands while she walks him in to get his flu shot. And Kylo Ren is scared of needles, so it's just adorable. I love it. It's so cute. But then we get this moment of foreshadowing because Olive is like, oh my gosh, this new lab is everything I've ever worked towards and everything I ever want. Life cannot get better than this. Arn sees Olive giggling while texting Adam one day and she's like, oh my God, it's so cute. You're in love. Ha 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 And Olive is like, oh my God, what do you mean I'm in love? No, not the feelings. It's fine. We're all very calm and mature adults. It is at this stage that Olive debriefs with Malcolm as it is super rare for her to feel like this, like she really never feels sexual attraction towards like anyone. And we also learn about Olive's lifelong and historically valid abandonment issues. Olive is just like declaring that she has a huge crush on him when she realizes that Adam is actually standing right behind her. He heard everything of the last bit, and so Olive decides to lie and say that she wasn't talking about how she has a giant crush on Adam. And before they can really discuss it further, Sexy Holden, aka Dr. Rodriguez and not the car, appears. Turns out Adam and Holden grew up together, but Holden doesn't like Tom, which is a big red flag, but that's fine. We will step around that. While Adam is on a work trip in Boston with Tom, Olive realizes that she misses him. A frappa dappa dickhead. Like a frappa cappuccino. <laughs> Holden is talking to her one day about how he is so glad that Adam finally had the courage to ask her out because he's been going on and on about this amazing girl he works with for years. And Olive's like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm depriving him of seeing this girl that he's been having a crush on. Olive! Pull your shit together. I'm glad you were also frustrated because I read this and I was like, seriously, Olive. Seriously, Olive, Olive. were we all not present for the bathroom moment? Olive, or was that just us? What were you doing? I was actually taking a shit in one of those cubicles. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm just singing so you can't hear me. La, 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 la. <laughs> Anyways, so Olive receives news that she has been selected to speak at a panel and is freaking out because obviously she is goofy, goofy girl and does not do good public speaking. Fantastic. And then it gets even better because she needs accommodation for the conference and lucky her boyfriend is going so they can room together. Again. Listen, we knew right at the beginning of this book that this conference was coming up and that she was going to it. She knew she was going to be in Boston for this weekend. She knew she was going to be a guest speaker, but she was going to that conference. Why, pray tell me, why didn't they have accommodation lined up? Four weeks in advance if they knew that everything was going to be booked up ahead of time. They did. They did. Because they students. They did. They did. They did. And then they, 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 the friends said that they switched because they thought that she would want to stay with yeah. Well, they hadn't got accommodation then. You get what I'm saying? I disagree. But no, the thoughts, they were all going to go together. So there was no issue for Olive. There was no worry in her head until they all decided to 
pull out. So really it's her friends. No, we are big planners in advance. Not everyone is. Yeah. Some people just get to glide through the world. Must be nice. <laughs> so Adam spontaneously appears in front of her like a magical Kylo Ren-sized science genie. And at the beginning when they established that they were fake dating, she was like, well, we've got to have rules because that's what you do with this type of thing. And he's like, this type of thing? She's like, yeah, in all the books where there's fake dating. And now she does this thing where she's like, no, you don't understand. If we share accommodation, there will only be one bed. That's just how it works. <laughs> you will book two, but there will be one. And he's like, what the fuck? <laughs> but he's just like, I'm just going to let you be you. But there is actually two beds. But anyways, they <laughs> agree to be roommates. Fantastic. And he offers to help her with her slides for her presentation. And Olive realizes that she always feels like Adam has her back, no matter how crazy she is, which is all you could really want in a partner, honestly, or yeah. podcast co-host. Someone who's just like, I'm right or die for you, bitch. So it's conference time. Olive is getting dressed for her talk and is wearing like a little black dress that is giving us corporate sex goddess. And I love that for her. And then Adam walks in and he is shooketh and wholeheartedly agrees that she is a goddess like he literally stops moving his mouth drops open like a fish it's beautiful and she's just like oh my god is this like professional and he's like yeah professional that's a word yep but again she doesn't pick up on the vibes and that's fine we learn that adam is actually the keynote speaker of the conference as well so he can't make it to her speech which is really sad but he's like super supportive olive gives her talk and it goes well but then tom aka cunt face is there and his cunt face is in fact revealed. Just gets his cunt out. <laughs> <laughs> Drops his pants. It's actually. <laughs> you are shooting Here my, is my cunt. cunt. <laughs> Here is my wet ass pussy. Oh my God. <laughs> From the first word, the vibes are off. Like Tom has waited for her in this like corner of the room until the room is completely empty. Then he starts asking where Adam is and then makes like shitty comments when he knows that Adam isn't there. Then Tom tries to kiss her and she pushes him off, but he tries again and then laughs at her. And then then makes it very clear that he expects sexual favours from her in return for advancing her career. Olive is in wow. shock, but then he doubles down. He suggests that she is fucking Adam for professional gain, and that's why she was even selected for the panel in the first place. She says that she will tell Adam, and he makes her question who Adam would believe, and he even threatens to steal her work if she doesn't still come to work with him in the following year. Dude. Actual trash panda. Way to become every male stereotype of the power imbalance, Tom. Do better. The bar was on the floor already. So Adam finds Olive crying in the hotel room and the quote we get is she started when she found him kneeling in front of her right by her chair his head level with hers studying her with a worried frown she made to hide her face in her palms but his hands came up to her chin and lifted it up until she had no choice but to meet his eyes and his fingers slid up to her cheek cupping it as he asked yet again olive what happened? Olive says that she heard people talking shit about her, but doesn't tell Adam that it was Tom. And we get this moment. There was something underneath his tone, something pressing that hinted at violence and rage and broken bones. Adam's hand was still gentle on her cheek, but his eyes narrowed. There was a new tension in his jaw and Olive felt a shiver run down her spine smash adam is like you is special you is kind you is a motherfucking fantastic scientist and holds her while she cries and then adam decides to skip out on all the other functions of the conference to spend time with his girlfriend and takes olive out like this whole scene in chapter 15 as they pick a place to eat like i can bust because we get the moment where he pinches the bridge of his nose as he sighs because she is being so much but then obviously still does whatever she wants and i simply want to die i love it i love it so they have a sushi day and again the vibes are great i love it when they go back to the hotel room he scoops her up because her feet hurt and like carries her to the room they decide to stay in and watch a movie but first olive needs to shower obviously and what do you know she forgot her pajamas of course she did. i would like to thank our lord and savior ali hazelwood for this moment yes yep. adam lends her a shirt and seems to combust when he sees her in the shirt because it is so big on her because she is so small but alas that's it. Olive wants to leave the conference and this leads to Adam giving her the full backstory of his abusive mentor who got away with heaps and he tries to convince her that she is brilliant. And the quote we get is, I wish you could see yourself the way I see you. Oh, I'm going to be wanna absolutely die. barely sick. <laughs> barely sick. Yeah. Yeah, look. We love it. Olive and yet decide- she's still thinking, but he's in love with someone else. Look. And at this stage, he also thinks that she's in love with someone else, but Olive decides that this is the moment when nothing else matters but him. She steps (gasps) forward and he could stop her from holding him, but he doesn't. And then she kisses him and he kisses her back. 
But he stops because he's like, I don't want you to feel pressured. And also, I really do think you're in love with someone else. And she is like, but I want you. Maybe you don't want me. And he grabs her hand and puts it on his bulging boner and says, you have no fucking idea what I want. Dead. Hello. And this is where I start enjoying Errol. the book. <laughs> so, I love the hypotheses that are basically at the beginning of each of the chapters. So I'm going to give you some of them as we go. So chapter 16 starts as hypothesis. Despite what everyone says, sex is never going to be anything more than a mildly enjoyable activity. Oh, oh. <laughs> I love it. I love it. But we continue off where we left. And Adam is like a man starved and is absolutely all in for our girl. We get this moment where he literally puts her entire boob into <laughs> his mouth and she's afraid that he will swallow her whole. So that's a thing. Entire Ellie boob. Out. Entire. Entire boob. Entire boob. I just, is it a tiny boob or is it a giant mouth? They're my questions. I think it's both. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I am a former member of the Itty Bitty Titty Committee, so I fully support any size of breast. But for some reason, I literally just pictured her breasts not having any other definition other than the nipple. And the nipple was the size of a ping pong ball and it just projected <laughs> outwards like that. And he was just like. <laughs> yes. Swallowed boob hole. He finds out that she's barely not a virgin and he says that he can't do this. But Olive is like, fuck you and fuck me ASAP. And he's like, okay, but you've got to give me brunch first. And then he just nom, 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 <laughs> nom on that fan. <laughs> nom, nom, nom on her fan fan. When he finally decides like enough is enough, we get this moment where Olive says, you're so big. And he says, you can take it. Oh I God. want to die. I love it. I love it. They fuck and it's brilliant. He wants to make sure it's good for her, but she's like, shut the fuck up and fill me up, daddy, which he does. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he plays with her after and like mixes him and her juices inside her like some <laughs> weird fucked up version of Ready Steady Cook. Or <laughs> oh it's a God. Oh my God, Ready Steady Cook. Wow. Uncovered memories. <laughs> oh my God. Flooding back. The capsicums. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. Or, After school delight. <laughs> it makes sense if it's a science experiment and not ready, steady, cook, though. So, I guess. Not as funny. Anyway, so she then is like, speaking of ready, steady, cook, I'm going to give you the best gobby and I'm going to eat your dick, which is great. Not literally eat. I think I need to clarify that because the books that I'm reading at the moment are really questionable and I feel like oh someone God. might actually eat someone's dick. Anyway. That would be so chewy. <laughs> The texture of that, I'd imagine Not quite good. similar to like kangaroo meat or something, which is like tenderly. Except it's in anyway. a sock. I normally enjoy <laughs> eating kangaroo and then you had to say it was like eating a dick and it's tenderly and now I will never be able to eat it again. <laughs> so that's great. Give him a great gobby. We end up finding out that he's planning on moving to Harvard where she's supposed to be going, obviously, but she's not going because of the predator Tom. We shan't be doing that. We get another hypothesis. <laughs> a heart will break even more easily than the weakest of hydrogen bonds. And if I understood anything about science, I'm sure this would make sense. We find out that Malcolm and Holden are fucking and it is September 29th, meaning that Olive and Adam's fake relationship is over. Dun, dun, dun. Olive isn't doing very well. She can't ruin Adam and Tom's friendship, even though... Fuck that cunt. She calls things off with Adam. She's depressed. She's speaking with Arn and Malcolm when she realizes while she was trying to record her speech at that place, she also recorded what Tom said to her. And then she accidentally plays no. it out loud in front of her friends. Arn and Malcolm are obviously very pissed off. And Olive spills the beans that she was never actually dating Adam to Arn, even though really she was. Like, at this point, she fucking was, okay? Like, they, they were fucking dating. They decide that they're going to speak with Holden for advice in relation to whether or not to tell Adam what has happened with Tom. Because obviously, Tom and Adam are friends with a really long time. It's a little bit whatever. We're like, fuck that asshole. Burn in hell. Holden ends up giving some words of wisdom, though. And he's like, theoretically, if I had information that could show Adam how much of a fucking twat Tom is, I would show him that evidence. And to be honest, he's fucking in love with you, so absolutely you should show him. Olive Thank is you, like, Holden. that's enough. Twist my fucking arm. I'm going. <laughs> Olive goes to see Adam at his last interview for Harvard. It's like a dinner, and of course, dickhead Tom is there. Adam asks tom to like give them a minute but tom's like bro come on dude like seriously brethren let's fucking go <laughs> brethren? 
Brotherin. <laughs> That's amazing. My brother in Chris, yeah. what's up? But Olive plays the recording, like as Tom and Adam are standing there. Like, right, just there. I love it. And Adam goes deadly calm. This is, like, my favourite part of the of the book. This is my favourite part. Feral. Then he realises that it's Tom who made her cry, and we get this fucking moment. Adam exploded so fast, she didn't even see him move. One moment he stood in front of her, and the next he was pinning Tom against the wall. I'm going to kill you, he gritted out, little more than a growl. If you say another word about the woman I love, if you look at her... If you even think about her, I'm going to fucking kill you. Adam, <gasps> Tom choked out. Actually, I will kill you anyway. Oh, oh. that is Someone so give hot. give me a bucket because I'm going <laughs> to just be sick. <laughs> it's like, for what? <laughs> what? I was and like, a moth? <laughs> oh, my God, that is so hot. That's the Kylo Ren moment. Where it Ali is. was like, I just need a, like, yeah. Fucking hot. Do you know what makes it better? Tom is blonde. Yeah, fuck True. up that blonde love interest. Not love interest. Mm-hmm. Blonde man. No. So Adam ends up being like, I'm going to go explain to the Dean what happens. He tells Olive, I'm going to take care of this. And then I'm going to come find you and take care of you. Take Ooh, care hey. of me. He does indeed do that. And him, Malcolm, Holden, and Olive end up going on a double date. Nothing is really discussed about Tom. He's dead, hopefully. <laughs> but we actually do end up finding out later that he's being fired and is being handled. But not manhandled. But, I mean, maybe he deserves it. <laughs> he's in the chain of the Harvard <laughs> Dean's office. He's in the chain. He's in, like, a dungeon. He's, like he's just handcuffed. chained to his desk. And he's forced uh, yeah. to watch Ready, Steady, Cook. <laughs> <laughs> on repeat. <laughs> but, anyway, this is the last time I'm going to bring up that fucking cunt, Tom. I swear to fuck. Mm, May he yeah. fucking die in hell. Olaf finds out that Adam was the guy in the bathroom. He tells her, he's like, that was me. Surprise, bitch. And he's been obsessed with her ever since that day. And <laughs> she is is like I was the crush all along. It was and she's me. shook by this, but no one else is surprised. <laughs> um, she decides she's going to tell him that she lied about loving someone else because it was him all along. And she's like crying and he's freaking out. And we get this moment that makes me fucking weak, which is Olive. He pulled her closer, pressing his lips against her forehead. It doesn't matter whatever it is that you're crying about. I will fix it. I will make it right. Because he's like freaking out. He's like, oh my God, she's crying over something. He's like, I will take care of you. Let me fix you. I, am, what, I will take care of you. What do I need to do? Why are you crying? Yeah. And she ends up being like, no, it's you. I love you. And she, she says that I love you in Dutch or something. It's another language. We don't understand. I don't know. It's yeah, we fine. kind of yeeted but- past that. In his traumatic backstory, he grew up around the world but like he's he's dutch so we then jump straight to the epilogue it's them like 10 months later recreating their first kiss it's gorgeous and i love it very much and that's it book's done i will say i I read the acknowledgements and i do like the fact that ali hazelwood actually was a scientific like grad student she has a background in academia which is why she writes Mm. These types of books. Because when I was reading it, I was thinking, gosh, you would have had to done a shitload of research to have all of these like scientific anecdotes in there. Like, Jesus Christ. But no, it turns out she just knows that shit. So she's very, very clever. Oh, well done, you clever sausage. Just not my cup of tea. And that's okay. That's fine. Look no, it's it. not. <laughs> I disagree. One of our most controversial episodes yet where one of us doesn't like the book and the other two do, we gang up on her. Or Ellie gangs yeah. up on us, honestly. Yeah, she gangs yeah. up on us. And there is not one point in here I think that Ellie felt like she was ganged up on. It was constantly Ellie against us. <laughs> yeah. Just I'm not sorry. That's just my personality. Uh, no Daddy. music yeah. references? I don't have any this week, no. I, to be fair, I didn't look. There's probably some out there. There you go. Love Hypothesis playlist on Spotify. Eat your hearts out. In a surprising twist of events, it's a shock. It's not specifically fan art for this book, but since The Love Hypothesis is a Star Wars fan fiction, specifically Kylo Ren, aka Ben Solo and Rey, I give you Lilithsaw. Lilithsaw is the artist who did the covers and does all the covers for Ali Hazelwood books and also has like a God-given talent for producing explicit, not safe for work, Kylo Ren and Ray Fanner. We won't be able to share this on our Instagram story like we normally do, as the artist specifically has a do not repost tag, but you can find everything. If you Google Lila Saw Not Safe for Work, it'll pop up. But otherwise, we're going to link her Tumblr specifically, as there's a lot of there are on their Tumblr. Yeah. Yes. Now I'm just In lost. In fact, what she says. <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> so surprisingly, it had some fan art, Not Safe for Work fan art for the fluffy rom-com. I'm proud of it. That is the love hypothesis done. 
right? How exciting. You're like, oh my God, girls, what are you doing next? And you better fucking believe that after the fucking roller coaster of fantasticness that was the serpent in the wings of night that we did last week, of course we had to do book two because it just came out. So up next will be The Ashes and the Star Cursed King by Carissa Broadbent, aka the final book in the duology. Are there really two books? Oh my God. It's a duology. No, there's going to be six, but the other ones aren't on the main. Like, on these not, two. Well, this yeah, is the, yeah. the Nightborn duet, and then maybe we'll do the novella. But yeah, that is it for this week. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for another episode of A Book and a Bev. Love you guys. Peace out, A-Town, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to our podcast. You can find us on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube if you haven't already at A Book and a Bev podcast. Please rate, like, and subscribe. We hear that helps. We love and appreciate you and we'll see you next week.